This is a going back, remembering UGA interview with Ms. Mary Frances Early, conducted by Fran Lane on May 22, 2007. Today we're at the University of Georgia Visitor Center in the Four Towers building on College Station Road in Athens, Georgia. Thank you for being with us today, Ms. Early. I'm happy to be here. Let's, let's begin at the beginning. T please tell us a little bit about your early life, your family, your, your uh, upbringing. Well, I was born in Atlanta. I'm a native Atlantan, which is a rare, rare as you know. I was born in Summerhill, which is southeast Atlanta. And at that time, it was probably um, uh, middle class to upper middle class for African Americans. And um, I loved being there because we had a big house with a porch and swing and big backyard and had ducks that ran me, chased me, and I didn't like that. But uh, we had a pomegranate tree, and um, nowadays when I see pomegranate juice going for something like $4 a bottle, <laughs> I think about those, those pomegranates that we got for free. But at any rate, uh, my dad owned a, a restaurant on Auburn Avenue, the famous Sweet Auburn Avenue. And it was not far from Dr. King's church. At any rate, at, at that age, I didn't know much about that church, but as I grew older, I did come to know a lot about it. Uh, my mom would pick us up from school and take us over to the restaurant after school. Now we were on double sessions in school. We had a morning session and an afternoon. So my older brother and I were always on the morning session so that we could go to the restaurant with my mom. And it was a smallish restaurant, but um, it mom and pop type. But it was uh, my, what my dad wanted to do. He wanted to be his own boss. And um, I was paid to stay out of the way. And um, <laughs> so there was uh, the Auburn Branch Library, which was the only library for African Americans at the time, right directly across the street. So every day I would go over and do my homework and then just, just read. And of course, I love to read anyway. And uh, this was like putting a rabbit in the bride patch because I loved it so. My brother was uh, a year and six months older. And he was allowed to help in the restaurant, but I was not. Um, when, oh, my father was, uh, I guess, an amateur musician. He liked to sing. He had a beautiful baritone voice. And he sang at weddings and funerals and sang at church. And he wanted me to take piano so that I could accompany him. And so I started taking piano when I was six. The studio was just above where my father's restaurant was, so it was very convenient. But the piano teacher would rap you on the knuckles when you played a wrong note, and I didn't like that too much. So I stopped taking piano after a year. My father had bought us a big old upright piano, which I kept uh, through my college years, actually. And um, I would play on the piano even though I wasn't no longer taking piano. And he bought me this library of music. It's about, what, 26 volumes, I think, from beginner to advanced level. And I continued to play um, throughout my elementary years. So you were self-taught almost? It, pretty much, except for that one year when I was six. And um, growing up was fun, but my father wanted to buy the, the building where uh, the restaurant was located, and, and they wouldn't allow him to buy it. So we moved to Kennedy Street, which is northwest Atlanta, and he bought a grocery store. Unfortunately, soon afterwards, he died. And I was age 12 at the time. Um, I, of course, looked to my mom. She'd always been my role model, because she was a teacher in, in Monroe, Georgia. And she always talked about how wonderful it was to stretch young minds, and I thought that's what I want to do. And of course, turned out I did that. Um, but she was the kind of person who wanted you to move out on your own. She kept pushing us to, to do things, to explore, and, and she was really quite an influence. My father influenced me as far as music was concerned. My mom influenced me as far as teaching was concerned. Um, while we were growing up, of course, I've said that the schools were a double session. They were also segregated. And we never got new textbooks. We always got the hand-me-downs from a white school. I didn't, I don't think I had a new textbook until I was in the 11th grade in high school. 
Uh, but school was fun. I loved school. I guess I was what you call a nerd because <laughs> <laughs> I liked to read and to write and, um, and other kids liked to play out more, but I, I just enjoyed reading and being involved in school. And my elementary teachers, I went a year early because I had gone to a preschool, then it was called nursery, and they had a kindergarten class. And I was reading by the time I went into the kindergarten class. So I was allowed to uh, go into first grade at age five rather than six. And it was funny because my birthday is in June. So I was five and then I went into first grade rather than six and going into first grade. Um, I moved so rapidly that they wanted to, what they call, uh, promote you a year ahead when I was in the fourth grade. And my mom and dad said no because um, I was already a year ahead and they didn't want, socially, they didn't want me to be a real nerd. <laughs> so when I went to um, high school, I went first to Howard High School. And uh, there were only two high schools at that time for blacks. Um, Howard High School because my dad played golf and his, one of his golf partners was a principal of Howard. And of course I've said he died. So the next year I went to Washington High School and I was there for two years and um, got in the chorus, but it didn't get in the band because I thought, although I wanted to, because the band director wanted me to play the tuba. And I thought, that I wasn't your instrument. No, <laughs> I didn't want a tuba, that was too big. So um, when I was in the 11th grade, well, just before the 11th grade, they uh, built a new school called Turner High School, the same school that Charlene Hunter went to and, and Hamilton Holmes. And, um, because I was going into the 11th grade and not the 12th, they sent all the 11th graders who were in a certain area to Turner. My brother was still at Washington and I went to Turner. And there I started playing the clarinet. I was uh, in the band and the band director was such a charismatic person. He was, he was very interested in his students and I thought, you know, I'd like to do that because all the kids gravitated toward band. Even though it wasn't band time, we'd go to the band room. And so um, I decided I was going to be, become a band director. But in those days, that was not what ladies did. <laughs> you weren't supposed to teach band. That was a man's job. I said, I'm going to be a band director, and, and I did later on. Uh, in high school, I uh, <clears throat> was influenced by a lot of very good teachers, gave us a wonderful background, and it was a new school. I wrote the school song, and that's how I met Charlene because when I went to college and came back to turn it to student teach, she was on the, the newspaper staff and she wanted to interview me about writing the school song. And that's when I met her. But when I got ready to go on to college, I was class valedictorian as I had been in elementary school. And I guess you have to get something for studying so hard, even though you like it. And um, my band director would take about I think three or four of us over to Clark College to play to rehearse with the band and I didn't know but he was really just sort of gently pushing us toward that that was his alma mater and I got a scholarship from Spelman which was an all-girls school and that didn't appeal to me um, and I got a scholarship to Smith College and I Up thought east. yeah mm -hmm. I didn't want to leave my mom because my dad had died and I thought, you know, I need to be closer to her. So I chose Clark because, well, my band director had sort of primed me for it. And I was in the band there. I also sang in the choir, the chorus, and uh, started taking a lot of courses, of course. It was different. I was young, younger than most. I was 16 when I, I went. But I was just drawn up into all of this wonderful knowledge, you know. it was. And the teachers really gave us a, a wonderful education. It was a great place to be. Um, I guess I've talked about early life and, and schooling. I don't know if you have any other questions that... I, well, I, I had seen a quote from you, uh, mm -hmm. I think, about the, uh, your band leader at, at uh, Turner. Uh, Turner. Mm -hmm. Early influences on your life, obviously, your mother and father. My mother, my father, and this gentleman, and and Dr. Wyatt uh, Walton. Now, uh, yes, he was, as I said, he was charismatic, and he loved music, and he loved music education, and he 
tried to make students do their best, but also it was like a family. And I think I liked that more than anything else. It was, it was great being a part of something that was successful. And um, of course, I love music anyway. But uh, he was a great influence. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and talk. And you, you've already talked about Clark and, and what a, a wonderful time uh, you had there. Now, you left after you graduated. You had a degree in music education. Is that yes. right, from Clark? I got. Um, <clears throat> I majored in music education. I minored in secondary education and library science. I had two, uh, a double minor, because I thought, well, if if I get tired of teaching. I can always become a music librarian since I like the library so much. Yeah. Um, while I was, I guess, my senior year at Clark, I went to the um, Camp Lenalock, which was a YWCA camp in Bear Mountain, New York. Uh, it was out of Orange, New Jersey, the, the YWCA, but they had this camp, and I went there as a, the music counselor. And uh, I guess that was my first experience with a mixed group. Uh, actually, <coughs> excuse me, I was the only African American counselor, but there were a few campers there who were of color. And I enjoyed that immensely. We had Christmas in July, and I did Peter Pan with them, and it was just wonderful. And I went back, actually, when I was a senior and uh, did the camp for a second year. But that was my first trip uh, away from Atlanta, except for going to New York where I had a half sister. <coughs> and um, I thought, well, you know, this is the way we should live. We should live together. And that, as I look back and reflect on it, probably sort of influenced me when I came here. Mm -hmm. um, did you teach between the time that you finished at Clark and then yes. Came, went to graduate school? Yes, I started teaching immediately. Uh, got a job as a fifth grade teacher, um, but I had band after school. Mm -hmm. And uh, this went on for, I guess, two years, and then I was promoted to just music teacher. And I loved it. I taught all the general music classes. I taught chorus, I taught band. And that was good because when I became a music supervisor, I could really identify with teacher problems because I had done both the band, the general music, and, and the choir. So that was good. You knew but what yes. they were dealing with. I went to Interlochen, um, which is a national music camp in, in Michigan. They had a university division. That was my second year out of college. And um, I was trying to see whether I'd want to go to University of Michigan. And um, had a chance, there was more music that summer than I had had in my whole life because it was music all day, you know, every day, and it was wonderful. Really enjoyed it, and that was sort of a pioneering effort, too, because there were two of us African Americans there. But it was a wonderful summer because we sang in the choir, we, I played in the orchestra, played clarinet, of course, I played in the band, and, you know, there was drama, there was dance, and music, as I said, all the time. And I decided I wanted to go to the University of Michigan. Um, I applied and was accepted and went there for two summers. And it was, at that time, it was 1961. And this was when I saw the newsreel about Charlene and Hamilton. And um, I decided I'm going to go to the University of Georgia. This is where I should go. <coughs> Excuse me, I need to get some water. Tell us a little bit about that admissions process. <laughs> Not a pleasant experience. No, it wasn't. And you know, <clears throat> I found, I guess, about five years ago that there was an investigative report. Um, I didn't know until five years ago that they had done one. I knew they had done one for Charlene and Hamilton, but I didn't know they had done one for me. And <clears throat> as I read it today, it's very upsetting because of the things that they were, were looking at, whether I had venereal disease, whether I had an illegitimate child, <clears throat> if I had a, rec a police record, if I'd been shoplifting, you know, just things that, that would never have even occurred to me. And I thought, well, you know, I'm a teacher. Why would they think that I would do that? But one of the reasons <clears throat> 
there was there were three women who applied to what is now Georgia State. I think it was a Georgia College of Business at the time. And two of them had had illegitimate children, and they disallowed them um, admission based on moral charges. And I thought, well, you know, I'm sure there's some white kids at Georgia who had similar problems. You know, why is this used as, but anyway. I applied <clears throat> three days after the riot here. And I that would have been in January. Of it was January 61. 61. Mm -hmm. I think it was January 14th when I applied. I got a letter back in forms in two days, which was really fast. But of course, they didn't know. I just told them I was a teacher and wanted to major in, in um, uh, get a master's in music education, and <clears throat> they sent the forms. I completed them and sent them back. But I guess when they got my transcripts, they found that I was African American. And that's when it started. It just, it went on and on and on. It was a cat and mouse game. Uh, I didn't know what the status of my admission was. I didn't know if they were gonna accept me or whether I'd go back to, to Michigan. You see, when you, when you went out of state, they paid us out of state aid to go to another university so that you wouldn't have to go to Georgia. And, and I accepted that, of course, but when I decided that I couldn't march on the, the line, the picket lines, because I was a teacher, they would have fired me. But I could go to school. And so I said, you know, I can do that. That's, that can be my role in civil rights and trying to, to get equal, equality. And so that's when I decided to do it. My mom was not really um, interested in my going initially because as I said, she grew up in Monroe, and there was a, a lynching in Monroe. Um, <clears throat> I think it was 1946, but I'm not sure about that. And uh, she thought, that's very close, and you know, they're still doing some bad things, and you, you need to think about it. Do you really want to do this? And Concerned I said. Concerned for your safety. Yes. And I said, yes, <clears throat> I do. I'm, I'm not really concerned about being safe. I think that this is, the time is right, and this is what I want to do. And then she was fully in support. But um, it took five months for me to actually get in. I <clears throat> came down, you were supposed to have, well first of all, you had to go to the courthouse with a form and get the clerk of the court to sign, or the judge, saying that you were um, an upstanding citizen. And you were supposed to get two alumni signatures. Well, I didn't know any UGA alumni, so I, I didn't do that. But I did go and get the um, judges, well, it was the clerk of the court, to sign. And he signed, you know, no big problem. And I sent that in. Then I found that they had requested my high school transcript. Well, fortunately, my grades were very good. And I, I graduated valedictorian in both places, and my high school transcript was really better than my college. And they were trying to find some way to keep me out, but there was a <coughs> required um, interview with the registrar, Mr. Danner, Walter Danner. But nobody asked me to come for the interview, and I, it was getting, I guess it was April, and we were having a spring break at school. So I called down and said, I'm coming down and I want to have an interview. Well, I was able to, to talk with Mr. Danner and his assistant, I think his name was Paul Keyes. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, he asked questions that I thought were inappropriate. He asked me if I had ever been in a house of prostitution. And I said, no, um, I'm a teacher. I don't, I don't do that. I don't need to prostitute myself. I was really insulted. And then he told me that if I came to the University of Georgia, I would lose the credits that I had at University of Michigan, and I said, well, if you don't transfer them, I won't lose anything, because what I've learned, I've learned. I'll just add to that. And <clears throat> the, it wasn't a long conference, but it was rather upsetting. I, I sort of expected that. I didn't really know what to expect, but I didn't expect to be welcome with open arms, because I knew by that time they were trying to find a way to keep me out. Well, Charlene and Hamilton were already here. And <clears throat> they had accepted the two, and I guess they just didn't want, they were trying not to accept the third. But in um, 
there were a lot of newspaper articles and um, a lot of calls back and forth. I telegrammed the president, the dean of graduate school, and, and Mr. Danner. Never heard from anyone except the dean. He, um, what was his name? I can't remember. At any rate, he did say to me that all matters about admission had to come from Walter Danner's office. And finally, in May, I think it was May the 12th, 10th or 12th, I got a letter with a red mark across it. I guess it's the one everybody gets, saying that I had been admitted. And um, from that time on, I, I knew I was going to go. And, but it was a long process, and I thought, when I went to University of Michigan, which was you know one of the top 10 schools, I didn't have this problem. And here I am in my own state, and uh, they are trying to say that I'm not suitable to come. But it was the same thing that had happened with Charlene and Hamilton. Of course, it took, I think, two years. But they were still, you know, they had that barrier there. And uh, I was determined. I was a citizen here. I paid taxes. And um, by the way, in the investigative report, they said that I didn't pay state taxes. But I mean, I taught, and they took out state taxes, you know, before you even get your check. At any rate, um, I was glad I had made the decision and I was determined to come. I knew, however, that Charlene and Hamilton would not be there that summer and that I would be alone. And um, that bothered me because I'm sort of gregarious. I, I like to talk and to dialogue with people. <coughs> and I thought, well, you know, hopefully I'll make some friends. Well, the students were not for the most part, were not unkind. There were some incidents, but for the most part, they just ignored me. I was just a nun person. I could have been a ghost, I guess. Uh, and that bothered me more than anything else. The, the loneliness of being, you, you eat alone, you sleep alone, of course. You go to classes, and in class, I took only music classes my first semester, quarter here. And in music, <coughs> it it seems that music people are a little more, I don't know, attuned to being human. They were, they were uh, friendly in class, but outside of class, no, which was okay. Um, but when I went to the dining hall, I had to go alone. And, um, but there was one incident, I don't know if you read about it, on my 25th birthday, because I was 24 when I came, and I had my birthday here on campus. And uh, a friend who had uh, a white young lady who was in, in art, went with me to register when I came down for the first time. Uh, I don't know who to this day who arranged that, but we registered together at Stegman, now Coliseum, then it was a gymnasium. And um, as we approached the line of registration, it, there was a hush over this big crowd of folk outside the gym. We were in line, and they just looked us up and down from head to toe. and. I thought all I can hear is our muted voices talking to each other. And that was a very uncomfortable moment because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't expect a riot, but I didn't, I was uneasy because of that. And she had a lot of courage. I mean, you know, she certainly didn't have to do that. But she met me at a local dentist, black dentist office here in, in Athens, and uh, we registered together. And I've never forgotten that. That was an act of kindness. But going on to my birthday, she told me that we would go to the Westminster House for hot dogs. And, you know, I didn't suspect anything. I had met uh, Corky King, who was a minister there, and his wife and his family had two young daughters. And uh, I had gone over because it was right sort of across the street from uh, Senator Lamp Myers. And, um, and you lived in Senator Myers? Mm -hmm. I lived in the same room that Charlene did. And I thought, when the first day I got there, I thought, why would they put her right on the street <laughs> in a very vulnerable spot on the first floor? That makes no sense. But of course, it was not a dorm room. It was a counselor's suite. And um, they were keeping her away from the other occupants, and me too. Uh, when I got here after uh, May, March, was the young lady's name, and I had registered, I went to housing and uh, found they didn't have a housing, they didn't have a card for me. And I thought, did they think I wasn't coming? <laughs> but anyway, I, I wanted to be on campus, though I was a grad student. 
because I thought, you know, this is where you get to see the most people and people get to see you because I thought this is what is needed. You know, we need to, to begin to mix so people can stop being afraid. We're afraid of each other and there's no need to be because there are more commonalities and there are differences. At any rate, we went across the street to the Westminster House and lo and behold, it was a birthday party for me. And that was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. It just blew my mind that these people didn't even know me and here they were celebrating my birthday. And there were other people there and I really enjoyed it. They had a birthday cake and they had ice cream and they had the hot dogs. But it was, it was just great. And I thought, well, you know, this is not so bad after all really lifted my spirits and at that time I really needed that because it was, it was pretty lonely. But um, as I said, there were some incidents. I don't like to think about the negative things, but it was not easy the first quarter here. But I got through. I made good grades. Um, I think I got two A's and two B's. And they had a, I don't know if they still have a long session and a short session of summer which counted as two quarters. And I decided, well, I think what I'll do is to take a leave of absence from my teaching job and um, go down the spring quarter. And that's what I did. Fortunately, uh, you know, we weren't paid very much money at that time as teachers. And I thought, this is going to be a financial uh, challenge. But the, um, what are they call the, the local, um, Teacher Association, Black Teacher Associations, because they were separated at the time, raised about a thousand dollars. My church gave me money, and that that really made me know that people were behind me. A lot of people were afraid during those days because they were afraid of repercussions. They were afraid of losing jobs, of go having to go to jail, and but there was that determination. Everybody wanted to help to do something. And my generation, nowadays, um, I think some of our students are a little bit too militant. I've always thought you can get more bees with honey than you can with vinegar. And this isn't their way, though. They want everything to happen now because they've been brought up with a lot materialistically and they feel that they deserved, and, and they do. But you have to have patience and I guess as old as I am, I can <laughs> be a lot more patient than the young people of today. But I said this in the, my commencement speech almost two weeks ago now, that although we may not have made all the progress we should have, we're certainly years away from where we were at the beginning. And you have to appreciate the progress that has been made and then build on that and continue to work to get it where it should be. But you can't think that everything is all doom and gloom because it isn't. And I don't know how many of them would agree with me, but when I looked at the audience and, and saw a, a good mixture of, of students, you know, all ethnicities, it just made me feel wonderful. And of the audience, the same thing, because when I graduated, I was the one person in class, and the, the family and friends who had come with me were the only ones. And that was the first time they had had an integrated commencement. But I guess you have to, to grow older in order to accept that kind of uh, philosophy about life. But my feeling is that um, President Adams and so many others, the GAP students who uh, instituted the lecture in my name, a lot of good things have happened. And I see students mixing, you know, blacks and whites together. I have a little cousin, she's not little now, she's 21 who's in the band, plays clarinet, as I did. Um, <clears throat> and she enjoys being in, in the band, although I think last year there were only seven. Now this year there may be more, I haven't asked her. But this is the way it should be, and this is how it has to grow. Because nothing happens overnight, though we may want it to. And certainly civil rights was a good impetus to get things started. but we still have racism in the world and it all isn't one way. I think that blacks sometimes are not tolerant of whites and vice versa. So we have to learn to live together. That may be one of those things that we pull out mm -hmm. to put in our special edited version of a CD that says this was a wonderful point that 
Miss Early May. It's true. It's and true. You're, you're exactly right. So you graduated with a master's degree on August the 12th, 1962. August 16th. August 16th, <coughs> 1962, becoming mm -hmm. the first African American to graduate from the University of Georgia. That's true. I laughed uh, at the uh, commencement. I talked about when I looked at the, pro the printed program on that morning, uh, there was a cavalcade of us coming down. I was so proud because I had saved the course and was going to graduate. And um, I was in line and um, I was looking at the, we had the programs given to us before the commencement began. And I saw in the line of march that the sheriff of Clark County was the first person in line. <laughs> I said, why do they need a sheriff here? Are they expecting trouble? And of course, I didn't know that it was a tradition. I, I had no way of knowing. I'd never been to a UGA graduation before. And now I can laugh about it because it, it really gave me pause and I was nervous throughout the ceremony. But I found later on, uh, there was a Dr. Popovich here who was in the English department and he was, he was certainly a good friend while I was here. He wrote to me before I even came. He had uh, known Charlene and gotten to know her and uh, he was just an exceptional person. And I took one class from him and uh, enjoyed that. But he told me that uh, there were, the president, pres President Adahoe had asked the male faculty members to be on guard during the commencement ceremonies because I guess they didn't know what to expect either. But um, that was a, a, a very glorious day. It was, it was a beautiful day and the only down to it, side to it was that we were asked to leave our caps and gowns at the, the door as we exited the Fine Arts Building. So I didn't get a chance to take an official um, graduation photo. And except for the friends who came, some of them took some Polaroid pictures, but uh, I didn't have a cap and gown on. I came back later and uh, with a newspaper photographer and uh, took a picture under the arches because, you know, that's the symbol of UGA. And um, I had borrowed a cap and gown, but I didn't put it on. I had it on my arm. And that was published in the paper. But there was not much publicity at the time, and I don't know the reason for that. It may be the university asked them not to, and it didn't bother me then. It bothers me now because there's still people who don't understand or believe that Charlene and Hamilton didn't finish first, that I got the first degree. And I'm, I'm not competing with them, but I, I, I love history, and I don't think it should be rewritten. I think that it should reflect accurately what happened. They were the first to come in, but I was the first to get out. And it was because they did eventually accept some of my University of Michigan credits. And so I got out um, in 62. And as I have read, Professor Maurice Daniels found you after years, is that right? Was it was? It was thirty years. Yeah, it was. Because you went on with your life. I, oh, I did. And I not did. a part uh, connected here. You were not as connected here as we would. I I really felt badly. I felt alienated from the university because I heard nothing. It was as though I had never attended, and that did not give me a good feeling. I was not looking for adulation. By the way, there was an article in. Well, the Associated Press did an article on the commencement, and the headline was something like, First Negro Grad Receives Long-Awaited Ovation. I had not been expecting any ovation. I mean, you know, I've gotten ovations on campus from the lecture, but that was not my intent, and I really wish they hadn't used that headline, but, you know, journalists can write what they like. <laughs> but uh, Dr. Daniels contacted me because Don Hollowell, who was the chief uh, attorney for Charlene and Hamilton, um, told them that, that I was a first graduate. Now, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't use Donald the way they did because they were represented by a team of attorneys. I was self-selected. I decided on my own to come. But when I needed uh, some help, I remember once when I, I was singing in the choir because there was not a summer band here. And um, I sang in the choir. And there was a concert, and I wanted to invite my mom and some friends. Well, the dean of students told me that, uh, I don't know how they found out that I was going to invite. I probably said something to someone in class, and they told 
But anyway, I was told I could not invite anyone because the university was only open to those three people who had been admitted, that they could not provide protection and that it might not be safe. Well, when I heard that, of course, I didn't want my mother to come because I, you know, I certainly didn't want all friends. I didn't want anyone to be, and I didn't know. But I did call Don Hollowell and ask him, you know, what, what can you do about this? This isn't right. You know, we're students and we should be, we should have the same rights as any other student. Well, by the time he was able to, to talk with someone, the concert was over. But I talked with him many times about various things that happened, and so he was aware, and he was very helpful. He never charged me for any advice, but um, he told uh, Mar Maurice Daniels that I was the first, and Maurice was doing his research for the documentary that he did, and he also did a book. And it, of course, it was about Horace Ward, not about me. But when he found that I was the first graduate, he invited me to um, an interview similar to this. And I remember it was in the Hurt Building, and I was, I guess, I had retired from the Atlanta Public Schools, and I was working at Clark Atlanta. And I went down, and he interviewed me, and he, of course, in, I think, part two of the documentary, he had a little excerpt about me and, and my, the role I played. But it wasn't until then that, that I was, quote, discovered. And after then, things began to happen, and, and they've just mushroomed <laughs> since then. We've put you to work. Hey, yeah, Lord. yeah. Alumni and board. I, and I enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy being because I think I can still contribute, and I want to help make this into what it should be as far as, far as I can, can do, encourage students to come, I work on the alumni board and try to get more alumni involved, not just black, but any. Um, it's just, it's, it's great. And on the Graduate Education Advancement Board, that's, that's wonderful because, of course, I came as a graduate student. So uh, it's, it's very enjoyable, and I'm back and forth here quite a bit now. Well, and we're glad, and we appreciate you coming down to, to, to be with us today. I wanted just to mention several of these things. Uh, there's so many things going on. The Mary Frances Early Lecture. Mm -hmm. There's an endowed professorship in the College of Education. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about how, you mentioned GAP. Talk a little bit about how those things came about. Well, I was invited. The GAP students were, I believe Dr. Daniels was their advisor. And in doing his documentary, some of the students worked with him who were in the GAPS uh, organization. And somehow they came up with the idea of inviting me to their annual lecture to talk about my years here. And I called it, and I, I told them, yes, I'd come. And I called it the early years, uh, Integrating University of Georgia, the early years, meaning my name early. And um, that was a wonderful occasion. I came down and I spoke. and. Uh, at that time, they, they named, renamed the lecture in my honor, and that's how the lecture began. I was, of course, very humbled and honored by that because I thought, you know, these students certainly didn't have to do it, but they seemed to be interested in what had gone on, and they wanted to know, you know, and, and of course, I told them <laughs> what had happened and tried not to make it negative, but um, just to let them know because I think if you don't know where you came from, you don't really know where you're going. That's exactly right. And uh, the history is very important. As I said, I love history and I think that it should be accurate and it should reflect what actually happens, not just what somebody remembers, because our memories don't serve us all the time. And that's the problem. But the gaps, um, that was really the beginning. And then immediately after that, that lecture was the, the 40th uh, anniversary of the desegregation. And I was invited down uh, as a guest. And I think I spoke at the, Charlene did the, the keynote address, and I spoke at the luncheon, but it was just remarks. Um, and of course, they named the building after sh the Hunter Holmes building, which was wonderful, I thought. That was quite a tribute, because Hamilton, unfortunately, had died. But um, I knew Charlene more than I knew uh, Hamilton, but I knew him. Uh, because when I went to Turner to do my student teaching, as I said, they were both students there and were very good students. And because we were, all of us were uh, Turnerites, I wanted to support them not only because they were black, but because they were, they were my fellow alums from Turner. Um, 
Let's go back a little bit. You got a specialist degree from the university in 1967, so you came back and... I came back because I noticed there weren't that many black students here still. And um, I guess I took a little vacation from 62, and in 64 I came back during the summer. And I came for four consecutive summers. And um, things were better in that I was not at Center Myers dorm, I was in Cresswell dorm. And um, <clears throat> there were no mixtures as far as black-white students in the dorm rooms, but, you know, we were on the same floor, whereas before that had not happened. And um, I guess things were easier because I sort of knew the ropes. I knew where things were. The music department was always warm and inviting. I found the professors there to be very accepting, very encouraging, and the students for the most part. But there were problems with students who, I guess, associated with the black students. They were ostracized by their fellow students, and that was at the beginning. I noticed less of that. That is, there were, the, was, was more mixture of students and people talking with you outside of class uh, when I came back for my sixth year. But it was still a very segregated campus as far as it wasn't very integrated. Um, I believe the summer I graduated, there were eight other students who were here, and, and amazingly, there were three in music. Uh, and I sort of felt proud of that because I guess they felt, you know, it was okay in music. Now, the others were attending, um, I think it was a counselor's workshop. They were not students for a degree. But um, nine students on campus still didn't make much of a dent. And I said it at the commencement a few weeks ago, there were, oh, let's see, uh, 7,100 students here when I came. And now there are 34,000 plus. I mean, that's, that's a big jump. And when you look at percentages, it still is very small. But, you know, it, it means we still have a ways to go, that we need to continue to work to recruit students. One of the biggest problems is that the really top students in, in all of Georgia tend to go to the schools where they get the most financial help. And many of the, if they are really, really smart, they have high GPAs and SAT scores. You know, Harvard gets them, Yale gets them, all the big schools get them because they can pay it. And Georgia's, um, I guess the scholarship here, uh, um, the, the progress with scholarships is not where it should be. And that's why I, I want to work to try and help improve that because I think that, you know, students won't, don't want to come if they can't feel that they'll get financial help, but they also want to feel that they'll be comfortable. And if we can just get them on campus, I think they would see that, that they can be comfortable. You know, it's a wonderful university. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it competes, I think, very favorably with many other universities nationwide. Those folks in the Alumni Society have really been working on you, I can tell. <laughs> Talk a little bit about your life after uh, graduate school and well, what you did. You were in public schools for 37 years? I was. I <clears throat> a wonderful commitment. Well, you know, I enjoyed it. I really did. I, I, I think it was 73 I was promoted to music supervisor. And then I had, um, gosh, I don't know, a lot of schools and, and teachers that I could work through. But it wasn't the same as working directly with the students. But I enjoyed it because I felt that I had a broader influence as far as music education was concerned because I believe that music does indeed bring to a child's life something that math and reading and science does not. And I think that um, to be well-rounded, one needs the arts, not just music, but, but all of the arts. And so my life has been dedicated to that. I became the first and to date the only black president of Georgia Music Educators, which is uh, the umbrella group under Music Educators National Conference. And I work nationwide, um, nationally rather, working with the Music Educators National Journal. I was on the editorial board, which gave me a lot of access to uh, trying to determine what goes into our national magazine and what people read, and pushing for diversity there too. And. Um, as I said, I was president of Georgia Music Educators and got a chance to travel all over the state to the various uh, districts so that um, I could talk to them as president and 
that was very, very good. I worked with MENC, our national organization, on standards for state standards for music education. I worked with the um, Macmillan Textbook Company as their black consultant to get more diversity into the music textbooks. And I worked with the National Endowment for the Arts in helping to determine uh, which grants would get um, recognition and get funded and was able to help with diversity there. So it's just been a, a broad uh, connection with a lot of things. I mean, I went on with my life, my professional life. I hated that the University of Georgia was ignoring me, but at the same time, I was in a profession that I thoroughly enjoyed and just immersed myself. And then after I was the um, supervisor for, I think, seven years, I became the coordinator of music for the this entire system. And that was, um, it took me further away from the classroom, but it gave me the, the opportunity to work with other groups to help make music education uh, more viable. And I thought that that was, was good. But frankly, I really enjoyed the teaching, the one-on-one -on -one with students, because there you can actually see the progress. When you have to work through adults, it's a lot harder. It's not the same, is it? No, it isn't. And then after, I retired from the Atlanta Public Schools in 94. And uh, it was because the, the red tape, the hierarchy in terms of sending us out into schools to uh, monitor testing, things that had nothing to do with, with music education just sort of turned me off. And I thought, I took an early retirement. I thought, I can still do something. And so I was asked to come to Morehouse College first and teach uh, a class in music appreciation. And I thought, yeah, I can do that. You know, I don't have to worry about all the paperwork. And I did. And then Spellman asked me to come and, and help out there, too. And I taught two classes there. And that was wonderful for two years. And then Clark Atlanta uh, called and said they needed a department chair. And I said, no, I don't want a full-time <laughs> job anymore. But they kept asking, and finally I said, I'll do it until you can get someone. Well, they didn't look. They didn't work too hard to find anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was interesting because although it was at a different level, high education is, is very rewarding because the students come um, eager to, to really push themselves to the end so they can get their degree. And, and they really act as an impetus to the teachers because with that enthusiasm, one can't help but be a good teacher. At least I couldn't. And I, I, I enjoyed it. But after eight years, I decided, you know, I've worked over 40 years. It's time to stop so I can travel and do some of the things that I want to do. And so that's what I did. 2005 in July, I left Clark Atlanta. And you're as busy as you ever were. I when am you just as busy or busier. But it's because I'm, I've gone to, last summer I went to uh, Eastern Europe and Croatia and Serbia and Budapest. Mm. And then in December we went, in January we went to Istanbul. And not more than two months ago we went to uh, Chile and Argentina. So see, now I can get some of the benefits that I've worked for all these years and get to see other cultures. I think you learn more through traveling than you do through reading. And to get immersed in other cultures and look at their problems and, and the good things, I had no idea that Chile was so beautiful a country. I mean, you know, you read about, you hear about all the political problems, but as far as, as the country is concerned, it's beautiful. And so is Argentina. Where's your next trip? I think we're going to Russia. Mm -hmm. yeah. but. Um, that's probably, I'm, I'm going to stay home for a little while. That's probably going to be next fall. You're going to stay home a minute. I know because trying to catch up with you. <laughs> um, uh, my last statement here to, to remind me of things is just from your perspective now, what are your thoughts? But you've done a wonderful job, I think, throughout in telling us what your perspective was at the time and, and sort of now from, from your from years away, what your thoughts are, are now. Is there anything else that you can think that would be, that you'd like to yeah. have on tape for, for the folks well, in the future to hear? My perspective on the University of Georgia is that it, it's a top-notch, first-class school, and that we need to spread the word. 
we need to become, if we're going to reflect Georgia as Georgia is, we need to become more integrated. And it bothers me that University of Mississippi, where they had so many problems, has a higher percentage of blacks, and I'm sure there are reasons than we do here in Georgia. Um, but I think there's hope because the, the, the leadership is there, and, and everybody that I meet on campus, you know, I don't know how they feel personally inside, but they, they greet you warmly, they get you involved, and I think this is the way it should be. And I'm just happy that I lived long enough to see the, the difference in 1961 and 62 and in 19, in 19, 2007, well, actually 2000 through now. It's a wonderful place to be. And I'm proud of our university and I want to do what I can to help make it even better. Thank you, ma'am. And certainly the things that you've done through your life have made it a better place. Well, I've tried. I don't feel that I've done. I keep asking the Lord, don't take me now. I still have things to do. Still got a list. <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh, thank you so much.